But I want to take a look at um, the Garden of Gethsemane. As you would there. And was read for us earlier in Mount Mark, the 12th chapter, 14th chapter. And verse 32 to the, verse 46 talks about uh, what we often refer to as uh, the betrayal of Jesus and him in the Garden of Gethsemane, the prayer he made. And we may often talk about this in the relation to the Lord's Supper. However, as you look at this one, really one of the most touching scenes in the Bible. There are numerous scenes that we see people of God that are suffering, that are relying on faith, that some will give their lives in order to serve God. And this is one of the situations where we see out the thing about the humanity of Jesus and the fact that he was going to go and suffer on that cross. He was going to lay down his life for us. And as it is so, we just see that, we see, again, the Garden of Sinai mentioned to us, and this here kind of gives you uh, a map that you actually can see, and I do appreciate the, the new projector and, and everything going on there, but we have uh, Jerusalem and the temple there, you see, but the Garden of Sinai and Mount of Olives and Bethany are all really pretty closely related uh, distance-wise. In fact, Bethany is about two miles away from Jerusalem. And, not, and so between Bethany, there's the Mount of Olives, so the Garden of Gethsemane really is just outside the gates of the city. So a lot of times in our viewpoint, as far as distance, we may think of them being far apart, really they're pretty close together. And this here is a picture of the modern day Garden of Gethsemane, or the location of it. And it doesn't mirror, obviously, exactly what Jesus would have seen, the disciples would have seen. But there's a, a garden there that we see that he goes to right before his arrest, actually during his arrest, and then all the other events that occurs after. And if you look at our text, that we see that he goes with his friends, with those inner disciples, or those, that inner group of disciples. And they go out there and they fall asleep, which had to be in some ways a little bit aggravating, but also keep in mind, now, this whole week has been full of experiences. That what we have referred to us as we look at the Gospels, half of the Gospels are really confined to that one last week of Jesus' life. And even though that, with the questions being asked to him and talking to the crowds and traveling back and forth or walking back and forth, and that it was a very tiring week. Anybody who's gone to maybe a lectureship or go to some that event where he had people together you don't usually get to see, and he's staying up late at night talking to people and conversing with them. And then again, early in the morning, he realized that the whole week of this year would be draining physically on him. And so we see that, son, with these disciples. And not that, but also that we have words used in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, all of them give the account of this, but words such as amazed and and very heavy, laden, and, and the idea of exceedingly sorrowful. Not just sorrowful, but exceedingly sorrowful. As you used the Bible when talking about this. And this here, obviously, is in relation to the prophecies made by the coming of the Messiah and his death that he would uh, incur. In fact, in Isaiah, he's described as a man of sorrow. Isaiah 53, verse 3. He is despised, rejected by men. He was rejected by his own people. The leaders of uh, the Jews, people that hated him. They, this here was all their plan from um, about halfway through his ministry onward. Of, we have to kill this man, Jesus. And a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as were our faces from him. He was despised, we did not esteem him. But they wanted to get away from him. And this garden of Gethsemane. And so you look at this Garden of Gethsemane, and it's a place that Bob points out that actually Gethsemane is the Aramaic version of the Hebrew, which means actually a oil press. And that is where you take the olives and you take it and you harvest them and take them to Gethsemane here, and they would have the presses where they would just take the juice and pound that juice out of those olives. And symbolically, that's what the Bible says, that Jesus enters here, that goes through his life, he goes to the wilderness after baptism and prepares himself for the coming of the ministry ahead of him and prepare for our, his life for our life. And then you go on here, we see as he goes to this garden here, Garden of Gethsemane, really he's preparing for his death. 
So if you want to make a comparison between the Garden of Eden and the Garden of Gethsemane, I think we can see one, and that is in the Garden of Eden we had the beginning life of all animals, but also man, in Genesis 1, verse 26, 27, man being made in the image of God. But also in the, in the Garden of Eden we find sin, the first sin recorded, and therefore the beginning of death. The death of all men, because the Bible says we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of death is sin. And so we have the beginning of death in the Garden of Eden. But here in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see here we don't have death. That's actually going to give us life. And so it's almost a reversal there as far as what those go this Garden of Gethsemane is about. And it's kind of interesting because when you look here, the word Gethsemane, Garden of Gethsemane in particular, it's only used twice in the Bible. And I was studying, getting ready for this lesson here, uh, just dawned on me, said, okay, we're not reading about Gethsemane before this night. And you don't. Now, only in Matthew and Mark do we actually have the garden name as Gethsemane. Now, Luke and John refer to it as the garden, but only Matthew and Mark actually name the garden. And as you think about this place called Gethsemane, we realize that that's what we sang about a few minutes ago. And really a lot of the outline of this lesson just came from this song. And let's just look at it again, just that 170. Because then it says, Oh, what wondrous love I see, freely shown for you and me. By the one who did atone, just to show his matchless grace, Jesus suffered for the race. That's us, so that's you and I. And then we're through Terry here in total three. Terry here and watch for me. But they heard him no bitter moan when the three disciples slipped while my loving Savior wept. And in verse 3, long and deep anguish was he weeping there for you and me. For our sin to him was known. We shall love him evermore for the anguish that he bore. And then, of course, the chorus there, in Gethsemane alone. Oh, what love, matchless love. Oh, what love for me was shown. Is wherever I will be for the love he gave to me when he suffered all alone. And so you look at Gethsemane, you see that Gethsemane was, first of all, a garden of solitude. And that is the place that Jesus would go to. And then he could go to and be by himself. And then look at what happens here. First of all, he goes there to be alone, but he takes his disciples with him. Now sometimes you can be alone and Separate yourselves from the group. And that's kind of what he does here. The soul week has been full of people. Of either his disciples or the crowds or the leaders. Or, and, and, this, and after this Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus, in one sense, is alone. In another sense, he's not. Because there's going to be people around him all the time after his arrest. But also realize that he was alone as he goes to that cross. And so he's alone here, and we're through from the, with the leaven. Now, start out here with the Passover, right before this. At a time of joy, a time of, again, this week would have been much like we would think about where you get to see friends you haven't seen before for a long time, and you get to serve God, worship God. It would be considered, I dare say, probably a happy time by most of these people. And here he is, and he goes and start off with the Passover with the twelve, but then Judas leaves to betray him. And that's why our passage says earlier in Mark 14. He leaves to go to, so he can now betray the Son of God with a kiss. And as he goes there with the eleven, in Matthew 26, verse 30, it's a parallel hymn. It said, When they had sung the hymn, they went up to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it's written that I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be gone. You know, the shepherd wants the right direction. And I imagine during the time of Jesus walking on earth that it would have been, in a lot of ways, company for that twelve, especially as they could walk with him, and they could see the miracles, they could hear the teaching, and, and you know, what would that have been like? I dare say probably there are times they just looked at that and think, wow. I mean, just look what he could do. We have this, our rabbi, our, he's our savior. But what did the sheep do once the shepherd is gone? Now they don't have that. And they're kind of like wandering sheep. And so it said, but after that I've been raised, I'll go before you to Galilee. And Peter answered him, if I all made a stumble because you, I will never be made a stumble. Kind of a bold statement there by Peter, wasn't it? But as you look at the statement here, 
Jesus responds and says, As sure I say to you that this night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, Even though I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so all the disciples, and so said all the disciples. Then Jesus came and with them to a place called Gethsemane. It says Matthew and Mark, right to the mentions. There's Gethsemane and Matthew. And said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. So he goes from the 12 to 11 to now the 3. Kind of like that inner 3 people, the core of, of his group here. So he goes and he has, like I said before, 8 and now 3 with Peter, James, and John into the garden. And then he goes into that garden and separates himself. And then he separates himself in Matthew 26 verse 36. He got kind of a little old man here. But says, then Jesus came with us to a place called Gethsemane. And said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. Our song mentioned that, doesn't it? About, and, and, and he took with him Peter and two of the sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and greatly distressed. Then he said to him, my mind so is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. And to think about what's going on here, <coughs> that we see that he is, again, separating himself. And, and I just kind of like how Peter, James, and John continue to go farther how to subscribe to us because here in Matthew 30, uh, 26 or 39, he went out of the Father and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass for me. And then the last time I saw it, but as you will. And Luke here, as he describes it, says, Gills a stone's throw away from him. And if I look at the Bible, we see that the writing and the words used are very precise. We mentioned, for instance, the definition of love. And different words in the Greek that were defined as love. Now, each one is different than the other and very precise meaning of the word love. Now, here's the point of kind of times where you see that it's simply a very general statement. That is, how, how far can you throw a stone? Well, just try to think about that. I guess it depends on the size of stone, probably how good your arm is. But you understand what he does here. He gets a little bit farther away from the others. And at that point, like I said, he is alone. And the scripture is saying about that. And that is over in Isaiah 6, 3, verse 3. It says, I thought of life press alone. That's really a reference to Jesus. And what's going to happen to him is that he's going to be pressed down. So that his life be taken from him. So the first thing is, when we think about the Garden of Gethsemane, we think of a place that Jesus goes to be alone. But then the second thing is, is the Garden of Sorrow. And the garden there where Jesus goes again to the garden to experience his great sorrow that he has. And if you think about his sorrow, that mentions things such as he is intense agony in Luke 22, verse 44. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down the ground. Had you ever been so pressed or heart pressed or something that is such a a great weight on you. They can't already call it very. And you don't know what I'm going to do. Well, that's, that's what we find here, Jesus. That as far as the weight of the world is on his shoulders. Literally and figuratively both. As he gets ready for this time. And so he goes there in the garden of sorrow. And somebody said there's a number of ingredients of sorrow. There's a lot of things look here. One is when, honestly, when you talk about death. Some of you are quite a bit above 33. Some of us, I should say. And then you have others that may be right around that time period. Maybe you're in your early 30s and just a little bit older than that. And there are some of you that 30 is old. I mean, you're young and, and you want somebody being 30 and think, well, that person is ancient. I remember when I was having my 30th birthday, I was sitting there and thinking about Jesus and thinking, you know, Jesus died a young man. He died when people are telling the, the picture of him. And he died in, in a gruesome way. And so when I read these passages, I see about Jesus as tears like sweat or blood. And I just think about the fact that, yes, how would I feel if I would know that tomorrow I'm going to die in the most gruesome way possible? That'd be hard. But not only that, but also the dread of shame. And that is, dying on a cross was a shameful thing. It's a Jewish law. 
Talk about the one person who dies on the tree, on the cross, or in that way there. And the, the people around him, when you read about the trial of Jesus, we feel find the, the crowd around some of them were mocking him, the soldiers mocked him, and they spit on him, and they beat him, and the crowd, they were yelling out, crucify him. And so there's no one sitting with cash of that. They thought they were looking at a terrible criminal. Because usually that's who died on the cross. But not that, but also apparent failure. And that is some of them kept on looking for this physical kingdom. And the Jewish leaders just thought about Jesus in very physical terms. They weren't thinking spiritually about the kingdom of God. And Jesus refers to the kingdom of God, and they all magically thought about a physical kingdom. He came to liberate us from the Roman rule and Roman oppression. No, he didn't. But if his enemies, I dare say the Jewish leaders at this point, were thinking, we've done it. We have taken this false teacher, this blasphemous person, and we have doomed him to death. And that's a victory for them. But also, the faithlessness of his friends. May faithlessness is a little bit harsh word. But you stop thinking about it. We have one that goes out and betrays Jesus, literally, and sells him so that he can come and identify Jesus to the soldiers and then arrest him. We have one that Peter, although he said, I would never deny you, that before night's over with, he denies him three times. And what about the others? The others scattered. Only John, apparently, is actually there to see Jesus die. And so, of uh, that inner group of people that was with him for those three years of his ministry, only one actually was still there. And so, in a lot of ways, that would be how would we feel? If we had our inner circle of friends who leave me or leave us in a time of great sorrow. And so a time of sorrow and a time of, of solitude. But also the Garden of Eden is a time of prayer. It's a garden of prayer. And that's what we've been saying about a little bit earlier for this morning. And I think about the prayer of Jesus. And he goes out and withdraws himself to a place where he can pray by himself. Now again, sometimes public prayer is necessary and, and very fitting for us to have public prayer. And at times we may pray with our family, but there's also times when we think, I just, I just got to pray, and you go by yourself. So you can concentrate on what you are thinking and what you are feeling and about with God. And that's what he does here. And so it's a place of prayer. And over in Mark 14, excuse me, Matthew 14, verse 33. And when he had sent the disciples, they went up to the mountain by himself to pray. And he came and was alone there. And my point is that the time of prayer, often when we talk about Jesus, there was a present prayer, but there were times that he just went by himself to pray to God. And so as a prayer that's going on, we see some things about prayer. Because it'd be easy to say, okay, why have you betrayed me? Why have you allowed this to happen to God? And uh, say that to him. But see, instead he's praying earnestly. And that's one of the words used here when talking about him. And Luke 22, verse 41. And he was withdrawn from them about stone throwing and he knelt down and prayed. There's the idea of lying down to pray. Also, uh, one of the other gospels said from Mark 14, verse 34. And he said to my soul, is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch the will of God that fell on the ground and pray that it is possible this hour might pass in him. Again, he's totally devoted to this prayer. And what he's going to ask for God. So there's earnestness in the prayer. But also there is persistence. He's persistent in the prayer because if you look again back in Matthew, you kind of compared to Mark's up. Then in verse 39, he went a little farther, fell on his face and prayed. You know, says that one says he knelt down, the other one he lied down, the only saw got you know bowing down with his face to the ground. And, oh my father, it's possible, let this cup pass me. Nevertheless, not as I will but as you. Then came the disciples and found them asleep and said to Peter, What? Do you not watch me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter temptation. That spirit that he is blowing, but his flesh is weak. Again, a second time. He went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father not, uh, cannot pass away from me unless I bring it to your will be done. And then it goes in and said a third time, he prayed the same prayer. 
Like I said earlier, I remember somebody one time asking, it was a lack of faith to ask for the same thing over and over again in prayer. Is it wrong to say, to show that I don't think God is listening to me or I don't think God is going to help me, so I'm going to keep on praying? Is that wrong to do that? And what we see here with Jesus is that he's praying time and time again at that time. The same prayer. And so, no, it's not wrong. Be persistent in prayer. Don't give up on it. And then only that, but also submissively, though, for that prayer. Because a lot of times people treat prayer kind of like a wish list or a God. It's, uh, it's Santa Claus. And I don't want to pray for something. I just want to keep on praying about it. But notice here, Jesus prayed three times. But how was he praying? He prayed, not my will, but your will be done. As you go through, oh, Bob, oh my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I bring it, your will be done. And in verse 44, he left them and went away again and prayed third time, saying the same words that Jesus recognized was what he wanted. That matter here, what matter is God's will. And in our prayers, we need to keep in mind that God has a will. God has things he wants done. And prayer is not a parachute to simply say to God, okay, help me now. In our prayers, we understand that we need to be submissive to the will of God. As we pray also. And so it's kind of a submission. But then another thing is that it's a, a garden of victory. And that is, when we think about the Garden of Gethsemane, what, what are we talking about here? We're talking about Jesus going and praying, and we think, well, you know, Jesus died uh, after this year, but God listened to him. God heard him, and he heard that, that, that he heard God, Jesus feared him. And fear sometimes uses the word cowardice in the Bible. But a lot of times when the word fear is used, it is the idea of reverence. A respect and submission to God. And so we look at passage that's Hebrews 5 or 7. For the days of this place, we offer up prayers and supplication with vehement cries and tears, and he was able to save us from death. And I served because of his godly fear. You know, God listened to him. And again, you may say, wait a minute, Jesus died on the cross. Yes. But God listened to the prayer. And God's will was going to be done. Jesus had to die on that cross. However, the man also pointed out this, that an angel came and strengthened him. And let's point to verse 43. That an angel appeared to him to him and strengthened him. As I said many times, that without the Garden of Gethsemane, there would have been no Calvary. That God knew what Jesus needed in order to endure that cross. And the same and everything that was going on at that point there. And so, therefore, this place of earnest, submissive, faithful prayer was a place of victory. When we sing these songs like Garden of Gethsemane, when we are around the Lord's Supper, yes, we remember the Lord's death, and now we have to remember also His resurrection. And we have to remember that He overcame death for us so that we can have the victory in our lives also. As we look at it on James 5 and 16, confess your trespasses one another, pray with one another, that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of righteous men avails much. We should not doubt those words. We don't know else what else to do. Go to God in prayer. And recognize the will of God in that prayer. So as a kind of conclusion here, in the Garden of Eden we see a lot of things. One is the enormity of sin. Jesus is going to die because of sin. I was at a funeral many years ago as a young man who had been killed in a car wreck. A really good friend of mine. And I remember the preacher looking at that, at that casket and just saying, you see this casket, that's the price of sin. That's how bad sin can be. And we have to understand sin is not harmless. A lot of times our society people talk about harmless crime. You know, who's hurt by this crime? Who's Nobody is hurt by this activity. If it's sin, everybody's hurt. And so we see the norm of sin. We also see the death of divine compassion. In Jesus' life ministry, we also read about the compassion of Jesus' wept. And also we see where Jesus had sympathy for the crowd that came to hear him and didn't have food, so they fed them. But 
So this here is the ultimate price of compassion, and that is the death of the Son of God. Quite greater compassion God shows than to say, I'm going to give you my son so that you can have life. That's compassion. And then only that, also the power of prayer. As I said before, when you don't know what to do, when you feel as if the way of the world is on your shoulder, when you feel as if all is lost, and as a Christian, go to God and pray to Him. But also remember, Thy will be done. Submit to the will of God. And finally, is the time of divine love for mankind. As John 3.16 says, God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son. The hair of which shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So when you're thinking about the Garden of Gethsemane, think about it in that term too. I have a place of solitude, of sorrow, of prayer, but also a garden of victory. That we look at. So this morning as we have our song selected for us to sing as our way of encouraging, perhaps some of you here that may not be Christian and may not obey the Son of God, and confess the mess of God, or repent your sins and baptize and remission of sins, we're here to aid you in that. If you have questions, feel free to ask after the lesson. But also, we're here to help one another. And anybody here needs our prayers to God. Maybe you are kind of like me and that God are in your life. And we're here to aid you in doing that. If you need to respond, go to his phone and stand soon.